the technologies that are going to be the next revolution always grow within the existing paradigm before they can articulate into a revolution. You can't get a revolution out of nowhere. You, you've got to be there. If you think of ICT, in the 50s and 60s, we were in the middle of the mass production revolution, which was the automobile, plastics, radio, TV, airplanes, all these things. Okay, so that's mass production. During that time, we had transistors, which made radios portable, and, and record players and so on, portable. So transistors were part, because that was the beginning of the solid state. Uh, electronics. Then we had IBM computers. That was, of course, gigantic computers at first, even made with um, with valves, you know, huge valves, and they used to burn, and it was terrible in a big room, a huge, almost like a building. So that, but that was computers. We had control instruments in the oil industry, in the chemical industry, and at the end in the in the nuclear industry very sophisticated control instruments, which were electronic, of course, they were analog, they had little, uh, you know, they were not digital, but they were already electronic. So gradually, when you get to the point where the mass production revolution is exhausted, because it has already increased its productivity as much as it could, it could increase the productivity of blue-collar workers, but it could do nothing about white-collar workers, because there was nothing that would sort of make information more productive. So you had less and less blue color, and more and more and more and more of a huge bureaucratic structure on top, so you had a huge problem, and so on with various other things. So you get to the point where those technologies are exhausted, their markets are exhausted, completely saturated and everything else. Boom, big bang, microprocessor, computer on a chip, opens a whole universe of new things, and gradually, the mainframes turn into mini computers, and mini computers turn into personal computers, the personal computers into laptops. Now blah, 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 it goes on and on and on. And the same thing, the articulation of communications, control, and computers, and electric typewriters, of course. You know, you, you end up having the thing together because obviously the big mainframe computers you had to put cards, punching holes in cards and putting them through the window and then wait three days until they give you the printout. So, but putting all those things together, you get a revolution. But you couldn't have done it if you didn't have these other things before. That's exactly what's happening now. We have biotech, we have nanotech, we have new materials, we have various other things. But I would say that 3D printing is completely within the range of ICT. It doesn't have to be, I mean, it. It can be part of the revolution, but it could be something that becomes relatively normal within a certain range for, because it's very much ICT directed. The same as, for instance, you can have holograms or things like that. You know, it's, <laughs> so you have either holograms or real things, but you're still building these things. Uh, and, of course, you cannot think of biotech, anything that has to do with the genome and all that, without uh, computers, stem cell research, nanotech, all those things depend completely on ICT, but they have a personality of their own, and if one of them does a breakthrough equivalent to the microprocessor, eventually when this whole wave of possibilities is, approaches exhaustion, you're very likely to get that type of breakthrough, then they will be the next revolution. But that will probably happen, I would say, the earliest 15 years, I'd say most likely 25 or 30. Because there is so much still to do in the information revolution and there's so much money to be made with it that there is no reason why people should go and, you know, sort of concentrate on something that doesn't have enough synergies yet. And it's still too expensive. Because the other characteristic of a technological revolution is that it has two big things. One is a very cheap input that's capable of being used for all sorts of things, and it's cheap and it will continue to be cheap. So it's like a breakthrough that's very, very special. That was cheap oil 
for, for the mass production revolution and for petrochemicals. It has been the cheap microprocessor now. It was cheap coal in the, it was cheap steel in the third. It was cheap coal in the second, cheap cotton in the first. So we have that. The other thing is an infrastructure, a new infrastructure that deepens and widens markets. This time it's been internet. Before that, it was a network of roads. You know, replacing, replacing the horse, the bicycle at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, and the train as the main means of transport and carriage and so on, changing to the automobile, which changes the, opens the whole territory. So once you have the automobile, you need a network of roads, you need a network of fuel distribution, you need a network of electricity because all the electrical appliances need electricity in everybody's home. You need the telephone because people are going to be far and you need communications. So all those things were the infrastructure of that revolution. So we now have this internet all over the world, mobile phones, which is another, you know, the whole, everything that, com that leads to telecommunications is this new infrastructure. If there is no infrastructure, there is no change in the... So, of course, we could move, say, to bioelectronics, and maybe there will be other means of transmitting and much faster things. Uh, that would be similar to when we changed from iron railways to steel railways, which made them much, much faster than before, and they could go much further, of course. That's when you get transcontinental railways. So there are some times when the change of infrastructure just makes it infinitely more powerful rather than, than change to something different in nature. But we cannot know. The most important thing about technological revolutions is that they are revolutions. They are breakthroughs. They are not uh, you know, just, just one more radical thing. No, they really make a difference. The microprocessor changed the world. It isn't like a little thing. Mass production changed the world. The Ford Model T was a complete change. Cheap steel changed the world. You could have suspension bridges. You could have steamships. Can you imagine going from, from the uh, sailing ship to a steamship going from three months to three weeks on a trip? It was absolutely and to have telegraph made of steel, of course, going under the ocean from Britain to the US, under the ocean all the way to India. I mean, incredible things, the changes that come about and how they, they transform everything for everybody. So we still have a lot of time to go before we get to that but it's not 100% impossible that it could happen sooner. I just think it's not very likely. We're far from using all the potential of information technology.